If you've got a copy of the Word of God, your Bible or phone with you, you can turn to John chapter 21. We'll jump in at verse 8 and read through verse 17. If you're using a device, you can just Google John 21 colon 8 hyphen 17, and then the letters NLT should give you the same version from which I'm reading. This is after Jesus' death, after Jesus' resurrection, beginning I'll begin at verse 7, now that I've told you verse 8. Then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he'd stripped for work, the fishermen, jumped into the water and headed to shore. The others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to shore, for they were only about 100 yards from shore. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish, cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to shore. There were 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. This was the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he'd been raised from the dead. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Let me pray, and my praying right now is just flowing out of my belief that God is alive, that he's with us by his spirit, and the same God who inspired these ancient words to be written can be here to help us unpack them this morning. Father, I just, uh, I pray that you would be here with us by your spirit. You promised to be when we gather in your name, and we want you here. So uh, for our own sakes, out loud, I'm inviting you here. Come, Holy Spirit, help us to get inside this ancient text imaginatively, help it to sink into our innermost people like a spiritual power bar that we metabolize, that energizes us, that changes the way we live, changes the way we understand the world, changes the way we see you and each other. We pray this in the name of Jesus, amen. For two and a half months now, sorry, I'm getting more energy. (laughs) Two and a half months now, uh, we've been looking at when God shows up. That's been the title of this series that we've been tracking through the Gospel of John, and I hope that that title, When God Shows Up, has helped us to hone in on this that I think is the central theme in the fourth telling of the life of Jesus, the Gospel of John. I feel like John, or the author, whoever, authors of John, all the way through are at pains through symbols and episodes and encounters and stories to show us that human history has shifted because God has shown up. God showed up not just through a human, but as a human. That's incredible that the creator entered creation specifically as a brown-skinned, working-class teacher in a very occupied first-century Palestine backwater town. This man named Jesus spent his earliest years on the run as a refugee in Africa, his latest years under the surveillance of his own religious leadership and the watchful eye of Rome, and those powers conspired with the applause of popular support to pin him to a raised wooden beam. So I think John would say to us that God showed up that he might die for us. In the words of the song, God took on flesh so that he could bleed. 
And as we've been going through this series, we've been looking at what is the impact on people who find themselves in the presence of this God-man, Jesus. When God shows up, what happens? Taylor, or whoever's running the slides, I think we can put up that first table we've got here. So we've been tracking uh, now for several weeks, and we've seen that when God shows up, he does things like bring incredible, life-giving, affirming joy. We saw this in uh, John chapter 2, celebration. You see, John chapter 3, he shows up. It's not Taylor's bad, it's my bad. Apparently the slides aren't working. (laughs) When he shows up to uh, Nicodemus, he brings new life, like such incredible life-altering transformation that it can be called for an adult rebirth. We saw in John chapter 4 that when the presence of God, we can be truly known. Remember the Samaritan woman at the well? He plums us to the depth of our being and doesn't reject us because of what he sees there. Instead, he beckons us into healing intimacy with him. John chapter five, we saw in the presence of God, when God shows up, there is physical healing. Remember the lame man at the pool of Bethsaida. And that, incidentally, is why we pray for one another when we're sick. It's because in the pages of the Bible, we see that around Jesus, in the presence of God, there is physical healing. And we, in our own short life here together at St. Moe's, we've seen that. We've seen people actually healed when in the presence of God, we pray for them. Not everyone, not every time we pray, but we've seen it. We want to see it more, amen? Amen. John chapter 7, John chapter 10, we see that he guides us. In his presence there is faithful, comforting, direct, authentic, transparent, self-sacrificing leadership. John chapter 12, we saw in his presence he elicits exuberant, extravagant worship. Remember Mary, the woman who anointed his feet with incredibly expensive perfume. John chapter 13, we saw that when the king comes among us, he serves us. Do you remember Pastor Rich Johnson preaching that? The star flinger. The star flinger gently washes manure from between the toes of the man who would betray him to his death. And last week, Rene did a brilliant job of helping us see that in his presence, when God shows up, he unites us. Not just with each other, but definitely with each other. It's like, it's like against our polarity, as it were, actively across the cell membrane. He is siphoning us through the torn curtain into the joyful, ongoing relationship of the triune God. He unites us with each other and with him. These are the things that happens when God shows up. And keeners among you will realize that I skipped a week, chapter 7. We'll come back to that at the end. But this morning, we're skipping ahead. We're going to leapfrog right over the crucifixion and the resurrection because this coming week is Holy Week. And so if you're with us on Good Friday, we're going to read... The crucifixion account, we're going to talk about the grace of the God in the cross. And you better believe on Sunday, Easter Sunday, we're talking resurrection. So this morning, we are leapfrogging over those to look at this amazing episode that I just read for us. It's unique. It only shows up in John's telling of the life of Jesus. The other ones don't include it. And I think it's so helpful because if we focus on this, I think we'll understand better the implications of Easter and Good Friday. This morning we're talking about forgiveness. The word forgiveness doesn't crop up there, but I don't think that matters because forgiveness is not a formula. Forgiveness is a release. We're talking about forgiveness this morning, and forgiveness definitely flows for Christians from the death of Jesus on the cross and from his resurrection out of the tomb. That's where we're going this morning. I don't know if you've read uh, Hong Kong's novel, disturbing novel, called uh, The Vegetarian. In that novel, uh, there's this woman, uh, In He, and she is the sister of the protagonist, who's Yong He, and In He is recounting this 
uh, exchange with her estranged husband on the phone. He has betrayed her in the deepest of ways, and he's now called her to try to arrange to see their kid. And she notes with pain that he is not apologizing, he's not owning what he's done to her, and he's not asking for forgiveness. He just wants to see the kid. And she determines she's not going to let him see the kid. And she says this word. We put the quote up there. She says, there's no need for us to forgive each other because I don't know you. There's no need for us to forgive each other, she says to her estranged husband, because I don't know you. I think brilliantly Ms. Gong there has fingered precisely our human experience, hasn't she? Because betrayal, betrayal stabs at our core. It tries to erode our confidence that we can know other people and know ourselves, right? It, 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 it claws at, at these identity things of, of, of our ability to trust our own knowledge, like, I thought I knew him. I thought I knew her better than that. Like, I'm not the sort of person who doesn't see that coming, am I? And I think often the way we handle this sort of betrayal is maybe an attempt to regain some sort of semblance of control, we just cure the concrete, right? I've discovered that I don't actually know you accurately, so I choose not to know you. I found out I I can't quite trust my instincts about people, so I choose not to trust. So often, as a result of deep betrayal, we cure the concrete. And I think this morning we are looking at a fascinating, fascinating passage where not only are we going to see betrayal and forgiveness, but we're seeing the very nature of Peter's betrayal of Jesus was to deny that he ever knew him in the first place. Before we go further, I I need to uh, address the elephant in the room, and that's that some of you probably showed up here this morning only because you wanted a palm frond, and you were going (laughs) to origami that sucker up into some sort of cross and dangle it from your rear view like a Christian fuzzy dice or something. So um, no palm fronds, sorry, not sorry. It is Palm Sunday, uh, as the kids reminded us, I do want to acknowledge that. And Palm Sunday, for those of you who are familiar with the tradition, is all about the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And we're not distributing palm fronds, but this morning's episode, it's got a lot of the same notes in it, right? Because the triumphal entry is all about a crowd, an adoring crowd who thought they knew the sort of king they wanted and needed. A week later, a week later, those same throats that were shouting, Hosanna, save us, are rasping, crucify him. Jesus, it turns out, was a different sort of king than they thought they needed. And the crowd, it turns out, was a different sort of crowd than they'd represented themselves to be. Denial, betrayal, isn't always individual. It can be corporate, it can be a community, but it's always, always personal. It's always personal. So Jesus, history-changing words from Friday's cross, Father, forgive them. Here at a beach breakfast, he personalizes for Peter. That's what we're looking at. Got two points this morning. Here's the first one. It's that forgiveness, God's forgiveness of us is personal. 
This morning, just to be clear, we're talking mainly about God's forgiveness of us, the forgiveness, the release from God that we find in his presence. We're not as much talking about interpersonal forgiveness, our forgiveness of one another, our forgiveness of other people, though that definitely springs from this. The forgiveness of God for us is the aquifer, the, the, the well spring out of which the other happens. Remember the story of our own namesake, St. Moses, who's quick to forgive because he knew he had been forgiven. But if your mind this morning is going initially to interpersonal forgiveness, we did a sermon last year uh, on uh, the life of Joseph about interpersonal forgiveness, and I put that in the sermon recordings channel on Slack uh, earlier this week, so it's easy for you to access if that's where you want to dig in later on. This morning, that we're talking mainly about God's forgiveness of us. Personal. I said earlier that one of the ways that we as humans taste the poison of betrayal is that it surprises us. It's like we didn't see it coming. It erodes our confidence that we can actually know people or that we, that we can know things about people. And yet, this story is different. Because remember, the story that we see this morning actually began way back in chapter 13. You guys remember that if you were here. Jesus was at a meal with these same people, the same guys who just jumped out of a boat, including Peter. They were at a meal together, and Jesus said, John chapter 13, one of you is going to betray me. He wasn't talking actually about Peter, he was talking about Judas. But you remember, Peter grabbed that opportunity by everybody's like speculating, which one of us around this little stew bowl, which one of us is going to be the one? And Peter steps up and he's quick to point out that his love for Jesus is better than yours. I love him most. I'll be shoulder to shoulder with him in front of the firing squad. Remember what Jesus said? responds to Peter, John chapter 13, verse 38. You'll die with me? Maybe incredulously. You'll die with me? Maybe gently. You're willing to die with me? Peter, Peter, before the rooster crows three times tomorrow morning, you'll have denied, before the rooster crows once, you'll have denied three times. Do you even know me? Do you even know me? See, Jesus knows this is coming. He's not caught off guard by this. Peter's denial of Jesus doesn't hit Jesus like a ton of bricks. It's a ton of bricks that Jesus carries from the first moment he invites Peter into a relationship with him. That's astonishing. Can you imagine entering into intimacy with someone, inviting somebody in a close friendship with you, knowing from the outset that every time they brag about how much they love you, that they are bragging that they are going to sell you out, that in your moments of deepest need, they're not going to be there. And yet that's the love of God for us. In Luke's telling of that same episode, it's at the meal and the disciples are actually arguing among themselves about who's the greatest. Presumably, Peter's there in the thick of it. He's always the one to open his mouth and Jesus speaks directly to Peter rather than to the others, and this is what he says, Luke chapter 21. He says, Simon, Simon, he's using Peter's original name, and I hope I remember to come back to that later. Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. If you're like, what is that? If if Satan were Mel Gibson, he'd say, he's asked to crush you like a worm. He wants to grind you up. But Jesus says, I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. Once you've returned to me, repented, strengthen your brothers. Do you you see that? 
Not only does Jesus see that that Simon is going in the face of all of his bragging about how much he loves Jesus and how thick his loyalty to Jesus is. He sees that Peter's going to deny him and he prays that in Peter's moments of failure, which will be at Jesus' painful expense, that Peter will not be crushed in faith. That's amazing. My guess is that some Sundays, some of us show up here and it's hard for us to worship and we're reluctant to enter into intimacy with God because we in our minds are reminded of all the ways that week or the week before or in 1981 that we denied God and sold him out and betrayed betrayed him and let him down. And you need to hear this morning, he entered into a relationship with you knowing that was going to happen and he has pleaded on your behalf though he knew that he would bear the pain of your failure. He has pleaded that that failure would not crush you. Hebrews says he always lives and intercedes for us. So they are they're fishermen in a boat and Jesus shows up on the beach and it says that Peter throws on his outer clothes because he's been fishing, jumps into the water when he realizes it's Jesus on the beach because he wants to be there first to Jesus. And he gets there and verse nine, Jesus has a beach breakfast going for them. Some fish and some bread cooking over a charcoal fire. He tells them to go get some more fish, and it says he serves them. And I think what I, want, what I want you to see here is that Jesus is setting the stage to address the wound of Peter's denial. What are you talking about? I'm talking about this. In verse 9, when he says there's this charcoal fire, it's, it, it's like, that's an unnecessary detail. Aren't most fires with, you know, with stuff burning charcoal? It's an unusual, seems additional, unnecessary descriptor. In the Bible, most of the times, fire is just fire. John uses this word for charcoal fire twice in his telling of the life of Jesus. The other time, the other time is from chapter 18. Chapter 18 is when the wounding happened. It's when the denial happened. Jesus has just been dragged out of the garden where he was with the other disciples. Peter there, remember, Peter has unleashed his sword, lopped off somebody's ear, and Peter tags along. They go to the drag Jesus to the house of the high priest. John gets to go inside. Peter doesn't. He loiters outside in the courtyard cautiously. It's dawning on him that Jesus is not the sort of king he thought he was. Jesus will not lift a sword in his own defense. And Peter, it said, cozies up next to the guards around a fire because it was cold. There is a charcoal fire in that courtyard. Peter, shoulder to shoulder, The guys who have just dragged Jesus out of the olive grove. Hey, hey, can I get in here? It's it's chilly out here. And it says he's warming himself there around the charcoal fire when the woman at the gate, John chapter 18, says to him, "You're you're not one of his disciples, are you? Ah, no, not me. I mean, too, too easy. Right, the way, the way she phrased it, she wanted no for an answer. He was just giving her what she wanted. A few moments later, still there around the fire, cozied up next to the guys who have just dragged Jesus off. Somebody else says, you're, you're not one of his disciples, are you? Again, no, <clears throat> definitely not, don't know him. <clears throat> it's too easy. And then one last time, <clears throat> a servant who happens to be a relative of the guy whose ear Peter had hours earlier maimed and Jesus had healed, that guy 
or woman says to him, I saw you there in the olive grove, didn't I? This time it's phrased as accusation, not acquittal. Not so easy this time. Uh Uh-uh. I don't even know him. And then the rooster crows. Charcoal fire. Three times Peter denies even knowing Jesus. Three times Jesus serves up to him question for question, a new question. Peter. Actually, he says, Simon, son of John. I think here he's using his, his, his old name, his original name, right? He's asking Peter to evaluate, how, how much do you want to live into this name that I've given you, this Jesus-given name, unshakable rock, Petros? Do you want that? Or do you want Simon? Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And you know, you know just a month earlier, Peter would have loved this question. <laughs> he would have been like, uh, could you say that again into my good ear? Do you, what? Do I love you more than the rest of the, oh, why do you ask? <laughs> yeah, I, well, um, I actually do, and, and here's how you can tell, because I, and he might have gone on to list his accolades, the way he'd stood by Jesus, the way he was a leader among the crew, but this, this morning at the beach breakfast, he's not thinking that way. My guess is that he is hoping to heaven that not a soul, not one of these others, hears Jesus question Peter, do you love me? Three times, three times Jesus asks this same question. And some people have said here, this is, this is Jesus, he's, he's making Peter prove himself. He's making Peter earn his way back in and show that, that everything's different now. I think, oh man, that's so far from what's going on here. Because I think actually with each one of these questions, Jesus is giving the gift of, of forgiveness. In his question, do you love me, he's holding out to Peter the opportunity to proclaim his love in a healing way for Jesus now without pretense. Do you love me? Not bragging, not boasting, I'll go with you to the end. Not this morning, not this side of denial. Not this side of sin. This side of sin, there's no day for boasting. Do you love me? You know I do. You know I do. He's, it's not about braggadocio now. It's not about posturing. He's just leaning on Jesus. He's leaning on Jesus welcome of him, Jesus' intimate knowledge of him, Jesus seeing into the depths of his heart both his love for Jesus and his betrayal of Jesus. And he sees and trusts and is leaning on that Jesus will still welcome him back. You know I do. You know I do. My guess is that some mornings we show up here and singing songs like, Jesus, I lift your name on high, just feels so far from where we are and where we've been that week. And you might think, man, I'm not singing that. That would be fake. That's not, I haven't been lifting his name on high this week. I can't do that. Or maybe you feel the other side of that, which is, I I gotta pretend. I gotta, woo! Jesus, I lift your name on high. Woo! Pretense. And I think Peter is showing us that in this question, Jesus is holding out forgiveness as an opportunity without pretense to ask him to look into our heart and proclaim in a healing way our love for him with all its failings, 
with all its weaknesses authentically. You know I love you. And you know what my love is like. God's forgiveness of us is personal. That's one of the things that I, that's the first thing I want you to see this morning. This is, for all of its weaknesses and blind spots and failures, this is one of the great gifts of evangelicalism in its African-American forms, in its white European and American forms, in its majority world forms. Evangelicalism has often gotten this right and has focused on the fact that in that great exchange on the cross, where God had showed up in and as a human being, Jesus, when his perfect life was exchanged for our sin, when he spoke from that cross, the universal, comprehensive words, Father, forgive them, and it is finished, he was at the same time speaking it personally to Peter, it is personal for me. And it ought to be personal for you. The general is always made up of the specific, right? The, the all have sinned of Romans 3 is made up of the no one is righteous, not even one of Psalm 14. He says, Father, forgive them. But he says, Father, forgive her. Father, forgive him. Mark, do you love me? Hannah, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? God's forgiveness of us is personal, not individual. If you're like, what on earth is the difference there? I'll tease that apart more ad nauseum in our series on friendship and personhood after Easter. Second thing I want you to see here is that God's forgiveness of us is rehabilitating. It's been 25 years now since the uh, Rwandan genocide. Uh, If you're less than 25 years old, you might not know uh, what happened there, but it was uh, tragic in the space of a few months. Uh, There was war between uh, the Hutus and the Tutsis. About a million Tutsis were murdered uh, savagely. 70-odd percent of the the Tutsi population was wiped out in the space of a few months. And one of the most extraordinary things in world history has actually come out of those ashes, and that's this um, forgiveness project. And uh, this last week, um, Morning Edition put out a transcript of of an interview between uh, Rachel Martin and this guy, uh, Philip Guvronich, uh, who's a journalist who's been there kind of following up on this, how this forgiveness project is going. I've got a little bit of the transcript for you here. Gurevich says, what's interesting to me too is what does forgiveness mean? I mean, to some extent, when I showed up, uh, when I went there and I heard the word forgiveness, I thought, typo, it sort of meant you'd restore whatever the relationship was before. Martin says, yeah. Gurevich says, and they would say, no. That complete restoration involves trust. That's a whole different thing. Forgiveness doesn't require trust. Forgiveness, there should be an S there, simply means letting go of the idea of getting even, forgoing the idea of revenge, right? Now even that's a big ask, I'll say. But it means accepting coexistence. And I think Gurevich is pointing to something really important here, and that's this. In Our interpersonal relationships, it is always wise, it's always good to forgive. Forgiveness means releasing of the need for revenge. It is not always wise, it is not always good to give back to that person the same trust that existed beforehand, to put them back in the same place of intimacy or authority or whatever it is, power in your life, as if history has no bearing on the present or the future. So in our human relationships, we don't always go this additional step of restoration in trust. But if you've got headings in your Bible this morning, if you've got headings in your Bible, probably this little episode that we're reading this morning, your Bibles will probably be called something like the, the reinstatement of Peter or the, the re- restoration of Peter or the rehabilitation of Peter. And I like that. I like that, that it's pointing to something additional here, but it doesn't go far enough because it's not like Jesus is just putting Peter back to where he was before. 
But he is doing something beyond simply releasing Peter from this revenge, from releasing Peter from the guilt of what he's done. And this, to me, is absolutely astonishing. For each time that Jesus asks the question, Peter, do you love me? And and Peter answers, you know I do. Jesus responds, feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. Take care of my sheep. You're like, what is that? Well, if you were here when we went through John chapter 10, the way that Jesus presented himself over and against the religious leadership was as the good shepherd. I am the one that you can trust to feed the lambs, to take care of the lambs, to take care of the sheep of God. And Peter, Jesus says to Peter, you love me, you feed that is astonishing. Like, does that clobber you? This one who in the moment of Jesus' deepest need has sold Jesus out, and here Jesus is investing him with trust to do the very thing that Jesus had done. I mean, you do not see that. You don't see Julius Caesar lying on the floor, and he's like, et tu, Brute? Will you be my ambassador? It just, we don't do that. And yet Jesus goes this extra level and rehabilitates Peter. I've said that his forgiveness of Peter is absolutely personal. And I've told you in an earlier week that the way I read this story, although it's in the presence of others, he takes Peter aside such that in verse 20, Peter's able to look back over his shoulder and see John behind them. But still, the text is absolutely clear. This happens in the presence of others, and I think that's important. That's important. Because every one of these other guys has been around there on the days that Peter's been bragging about how good he was, how thick his love with Jesus was, how loyal he would be to Jesus. They might have been squirming, they might have been grimacing, they might have been under Peter's shadow, but they all sure as heck know that at the foot of the cross, Peter was not there. They weren't there either. Only John was there and women were there, in the plural, three Marys and an auntie. But Peter was not there. He had just denied Jesus. There was no way he was going to the foot of the cross. And so, this morning, it matters that they see Jesus having a heart-to-heart with Peter and welcoming him back into intimacy with him. Full rehabilitation. It's not like Jesus is just sweeping the sin under the rug. It's not like he's just dusting his hands of this thing as if Peter's sin didn't matter, as if it's okay to just release him back out there to have another shot and see if he gets it wrong again. It's not like that. Something has categorically shifted here. Many things have shifted. Peter has repented. That's what Jesus was praying for. When you repent, come back to me. I'll strengthen you for strengthen the brothers. That's happened. Peter has turned back to Jesus. The resurrection has happened. Jesus, we'll talk about this next week, has come out of the tomb and now has unleashed in the world this potential for radically new life in him. And most importantly, in the chapter just prior to this one, chapter 20, Jesus gave his disciples, or promised his disciples, the Holy Spirit. The presence of God. The the same power that raised Jesus from the dead at work in these disciples to empower them to do what Jesus did, to be as Jesus was, the presence of God in the world. This is now at work in Peter and Jesus. No, he's still going to get it wrong. Read Galatians. He fails from time to time. But this is a new Peter, and Jesus forgives him and rehabilitates him and invests him with such incredible trust that he's commissioning him to do the very things that Jesus did, and he offers that to you. He offers that to you. We're going to go home on this one. Some of you, maybe this morning, this is just a reminder that God loves you and that he holds out personal forgiveness for you. 
And it's just a helpful reminder for others of you, maybe this morning, you are hearing something that shifts your internal perspective. You're realizing there's a wound inside you that comes from the wounding of wounding. You know that, right? Like sinning against God, sinning against other people, it hurts you too. I'm not victim swapping here. That's not what's going on with Peter and Jesus. When, you know the old saying that we said as kids, I'm rubber, you're glue, whatever you do to me bounces off me and sticks to you. We all know the, the rubber part's not true, but the glue part is. When we harm other people, we are hurting ourselves. When we sin against other people, we are shaping who we become. The psychological parallel to this is something called pits. Perpetrator-induced traumatic syndrome. Participation-induced traumatic syndrome. It's like, it's, it's grown recently out of studies of professional harmers, uh, but it, this is something you all know intuitively, we've known intuitively throughout human history. Remember Macbeth? Ow, ow, damn spot. That morning, Peter was carrying a wound in him, though he had wounded Jesus, and Jesus offers him healing in forgiveness. And maybe this morning you're realizing that the wounds you have in you, the sorrow you have in you, the hurt you have in you is actually from sinning against someone else, which is ultimately lodged against God. And the Bible says that's okay. That sort of spiritual wound, that sort of spiritual sorrow, that's okay. That's a good thing. Paul calls that godly sorrow. And he says that godly sorrow comes up behind you. It taps you on the shoulder. It turns you around and you see Jesus there looking at you and he offers you with a question, do you love me? He offers you forgiveness. He offers you the chance to be transparent and not triumphant and say, you know I do and you know what my love is like. Some of you this morning, you need to hear this morning that God offers that personally to you. And here's where John chapter 7, which we skipped at the beginning, comes in. Because in John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39, Jesus shouts over the temple concourse. He says, if anyone comes to me and believes in me, spirits of living, or rivers of living water will flow out of her belly. And then John glosses that. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. Do you know what that means? That means when when Jesus commissioned Peter with the Holy Spirit and commissioned the others. He's doing that for everyone who would come to him in belief. We get the Holy Spirit. So although for 12 or 13 weeks now we've been talking about when God shows up and ostensibly we've been doing a study of the life of Jesus, we could have called this whole series, What is the Mission of the Church? Because if you have the Spirit of God in you, you're meant to be doing the things that Jesus did. If, you, if we collectively have the Spirit of God in us, we are embodying that presence of God here. We collectively are a geopoint of the presence of God. When God shows up at 31st and Barclay, that means when you come here on a Sunday morning, you ought to be able to expect exuberant, life-affirming celebration. It means when you show up, you ought to be able to expect that you're going to be met by a God who knows knows you and who doesn't reject you, but who beckons you into healing intimacy. Healing, can you expect that here? You ought to be able to expect that God sometimes answers our prayers for healing. Can you expect that he's faithfully going to guide us through the community of God in the scriptures? Yes, we ought to be able to expect these things and forgiveness. You ought to be able to expect that you can show up in the gathered people of God embodying his presence here and receive personal forgiveness from the God who died on a cross for you. And so in a moment here, when we receive communion and we're gathered in little semicircles around bread and baked fish, I mean bread and wine, representing the body of Jesus, broken for you. When you're gathered around that, you ought to know that he is holding out forgiveness for you. 
And more than that, when you look across that circle at the other people who are standing across that semicircle from you, no matter what's in their past, no matter what's in your past, no matter how you've let Jesus down, no matter how you've cozied up to people who have rejected and crucified Jesus, no matter, he has rehabilitated them. He has invested them and you, if you're his, with such trust in you, by his spirit resident in you, that he is commissioning you to be and do what he did to be the presence of God here in Baltimore City so that you can expect on a Sunday morning when you show up, the Spirit of God is here in his gathered people, shaping you to do what Jesus did, to receive the forgiveness he offers. I want to take a moment, the band can come up. I'm going to pray over us. We don't have a prayer ministry during communion this morning, but I'm going to pray over us while Pastor Sam prepares to lead us in communion. Holy Spirit, would you do in our hearts what I can't do with words? You see the wounds that we're carrying, wounds that we might have sustained while we have been sinning against others or sinning against you, we know ultimately all the wrong we do. Like David said, lodges against you. So we ask this morning that you would give us the courage, that you would give us the authenticity to respond to your question, do you love me? Ian, do you love me? Kimberly, do you love me? Kirsten, do you love me? John, do you love me? That we would respond by leaning on you, authentically and transparently. You know I do. Father, we pray that you would enable us to receive that forgiveness this morning, that you would enable us to appropriate it in our hearts, that it would change, change us, so we live not out of bitterness, live not out of regret, live not out of fear or the cured concrete of eroded trust. But we live out of being forgiven and being commissioned and rehabilitated by the author of life. We pray that this little church family here in your grace might become a place of deep, resilient, transforming forgiveness because when we enter into friendship with each other just like Jesus we know with eyes wide open that we are going to be sinned against would you help us to come into relationship with one another with our forgiveness extended would you change us this morning by your grace in Jesus name